Theistic Evolution Critique, the Old Testament, Part 1. We've been going through the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. And uh, it's discussing a particular theological approach to uh, the origin of life. Um, you can have young life creation, which means in the last 10,000 years, maybe 6,000, maybe seven and a half, whatever. Uh, you can have what's called old earth, but really is old life creation. You can have intelligent design, uh, friendly theistic evolution. You can have intelligent design, unfriendly or non-intelligent design, theistic evolution. God did it, but you can't tell. And he did it by a slow process. And finally, you can have atheistic evolution where you can't tell because God didn't do it. This book is primarily aimed not at atheistic evolution, but at non-intelligent design friendly theistic evolution. And uh, uh, the current chapter is by John Currid, who's an Old Testament scholar. And uh, it's in section three of the biblical and theological critique of theistic evolution. We've already been through the scientific and philosophical critique. And this particular chapter is entitled, Theistic Evolution is Incompatible with the Teachings of the Old Testament. We'll be getting partway through, and I'll show you where we'll stop in just a minute. The uh, <clears throat> chapter starts with an epigram, which is... Uh, there is nothing new under the sun. And uh, as a summary, this chapter explores ways in which theistic evolution is incompatible with the teachings of the Old Testament. It closely examines Genesis 1 through 3 and responds to the five most common alternative explanations proposed by advocates of theistic evolution. That is, one, the functional model of Genesis 1 through 3, two, the view that Genesis 1 through 3 is myth. And those are the two that we'll cover today. Three, the view that Genesis 1 through 3 should be understood as figurative in theological literature. Four, the sequential scheme interpretation, which argues that the events of Genesis 2 occurred long after Genesis 1. And five, the etiologies methodology interpretation, which claims that Genesis 1 through 3 was written not as factual history, but as an ex explanation for certain features that we see in the world. Uh, though the explanation need not record actual historical events. Multiple features in the text of Genesis 1 through 3 show these alternative explanations to be unpersuasive. At least that's the view of John Currid. And actually I concur with that view. <clears throat> the chapter starts in 1844. Dr. James Woodrow, who held the Perkins Professorship of Natural Science and its relation to revealed religion at Columbia Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina, was asked by the seminary trustees to deliver a lecture on the issue of evolution in the Bible. He had been teaching at Columbia Seminary since 1861, year after the Civil War. This is Reconstruction, about 23 years after the beginning of the Civil War. Um, and his views regarding the issue of creation had evolved over his 20 plus years at the school. He had simply become more convinced of what he believed to be the scientific evidence in favor of evolutionary theory. Woodrow had made the following statement in 1883, the year before the lectures, the Bible teaches nothing as to God's method of creation and therefore it is not teaching anything contradicting God's word to say that he may have formed the higher beings from the lower by successive differentiations. And as several series of facts, more or less independent of each other, seem to point this out as the method which he chose. In his lecture, Woodrow admitted that he had changed his position from one in which evolution was not the true, was not true, to one in which it was likely was true. He concluded the following. I'm inclined to believe that it pleased God, the Almighty Creator, to create present and intermediate past organic forms, not immediately, but immediately. They came from something else. In regard to humanity, Woodrow alleged that only the soul of man was of immediate creation. His body, on the other hand, came from the dust, 
Genesis 2.7, he argued that this creative act is open to very interpretations and perhaps thus refers merely to pre-existing material. Therefore, mankind may have descended from some type of animal ancestor. This lecture by Woodrow created a firestorm and it produced a division in the Southern Presbyterian Church. The Board of Columbia Seminary, who had called for Woodrow's lecture, met to consider his position on origins. Frank Smith comments that the board concluded that while not agreeing with his belief regarding the probable way in which Adam's body was created, there was nothing with his carefully delineated views on evolution that was incompatible with the faith. So the board accepted his position as a possible one. The courts of the Presbyterian Church itself were not quite as forgiving. After a complicated and detailed debate and controversy at the Synod levels, the issue came to the General Assembly of 1886. The Assembly debated the question for five days. At the end, it overwhelmingly voted, 137 to 13, that Adam and Eve were created body and soul by immediate acts of God's power, and that Adam's body was made without any human parentage of any kind. The General Assembly took further action by recommending to the four synods in charge of the Columbia Seminary that Dr. Woodrow, excuse me, be dismissed from his teaching position. The vote was 65 to 25. Eventually, he was dismissed from the seminary. However, he was allowed to remain an ordained Presbyterian minister in good standing because when he came under trial in 1886 by the Augusta, Georgia Presbytery, he was acquitted of heresy by a vast majority of presbyters. The evangelical church today is facing increasing controversies over the relationship of science and the Bible, and in particular over the view of theistic evolution. But as we can see from what happened with Dr. Woodrow more than 130 years ago, this debate at its core is nothing new. The relationship between the Bible and science, especially in regard to origins, has been at the forefront of the discussion since the mid-19th century. Perhaps the arguments today are more nuanced, but the basic issues are the same. The difference today, as I see it, is that there is an increasing acceptance of theistic evolution, or evolutionary creation, as it is often called in evangelicalism, and that acceptance is growing by the day. Some evangelical scholars have joined the ranks of, that advocate theistic evolution. Bruce Waldke, currently distinguished professor emeritus of Old Testament at Knox Theological Seminary, made a video for Biologos in which he argued that evolution is compatible with evangelical orthodox Christianity. In the video entitled, Why Must the Church Come to Accept Evolution? Waltke gives warning that if the church does not accept evolution, then it risks becoming a cult, an odd group, not credible, and marginalized. Peter Enns and John Walton, both highly respected Old Testament scholars, have made significant contributions in favor of evolutionary creation on the Biologus web website and in other writings. These men are accomplished Old Testament exegetes and their works work must be taken seriously and discussed. Tremper Longman, Robert H. Gundry, professor of biblical studies at Westmont College, fits squarely in this camp. In a 2014 blog post, Longman concluded the following, but it seems to me that there is a good case, especially on genetic evidence, that God used evolution. So I find myself affirming an evolutionary creationist perspective. Longman also serves on the advisory council of Biologos. Others who are not Old Testament scholars but have great influence in evangelicalism have come out in favor of evolutionary creation. For example, Presbyterian Church in America pastor Tim Keller, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright. And my point here is not simply to name names, but rather to show that the evolutionary creation movement is stronger than it has ever been and is making inroads into evangelical thought today. In this chapter, I would like to consider some of the more recent developments in the debate over the early chapters of Genesis, and especially human origins in Old Testament studies. I will examine five models that advocates of theistic evolution have proposed to explain Genesis 1 through 3, how it can be interpreted as consistent with theistic evolution. The functional model, Genesis 1 through 3 is myth. Again, those are the ones we'll cover today. Genesis 1 through 3 is figurative in theological literature, the sequential scheme, and etiology as methodology. The functional model, Genesis 1 through 3, is about functions, not origins. Perhaps um, the most prominent advocate of theistic evolution among evangelical Old Testament scholars is John Walton, professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. 
Walton has written extensively on the nature of the Hebrew creation account in Genesis 1 through 3, and that should be a superscript 14. I missed that. In general, he proposes that these chapters are about assigning uh, the assigning of roles and functions to the various elements of the universe and not about the historical origins of the universe. Walton does some excellent work in highlighting the presence of concern for functions in Genesis 1 through 3, and I'm in agreement with him that such a concern is present in the text. However, where I take exception to his writings is the claim that Genesis 1 through 3 has nothing to do with material origins and that it is merely about establishing functions alone. I want to focus on one critical foundational aspect of his model. One linchpin of Walton's design is the proposition that Genesis 1 through 3 is an ancient Near Eastern text and as such is similar to other creation accounts of antiquity. He believes that ancient Near Eastern creation documents are primarily interested in function and not material origins. Therefore, Genesis 1, like those texts, is merely about the function and role of the various elements of the cosmos. This understanding extends into Genesis 2, which he claims does not teach the material creation of humankind, but deals with the nature of humanity's function and purpose in the world. In relation to our discussions in this book, Walton's argument has an important consequence. If the opening chapters of Genesis have nothing to do with material beginnings of the universe, including the origin of humanity, then, this, then the historical clash between science and the Bible regarding the nature of physical origins is a moot point. In other words, the early chapters of Genesis are really not interested in material origins, and therefore there is no conflict between them and science. It is my intention to test Walton's view of the design and purpose of ancient Near Eastern creation documents and see if his position stands on firm grounds or not. The question simply put is, do the creation accounts of the ancient Near East have a concern not only for functions but also for the material origins of the cosmos and in particular of mankind? Or to put it another way, are the ancient Near Eastern creation documents solely interested in functions and roles of the various elements of the cosmos? Egyptian creation text. No, we're going to look at Egypt first since that's closest to Moses. The first thing one must realize when dealing with ancient Egyptian creation accounts is that there are many of them, and some of them are antithetical to one another. The Egyptologist John Wilson gives expression to this reality when he says, it is significant that a plural should be ne necessary, that we cannot settle down to a single codified account of beginnings. The Egyptians accepted various myths and discarded none of them. I guess you could say they were the first postmodernists. Um, Henry Frankfurt calls this the a mythopaic mind, which admits the validity of several avenues of approach at one and the same time. In addition, one must be aware that many of the references in Egyptian literature to the origin of the universe appear sporadically in various contexts, such as in the coffin texts, the pyramid texts, and elsewhere. So, for example, there is no single documented account of the creation of mankind, but the subject of human origin is found in, a, in various places in a wide array of texts. Siegfried Morenz properly concludes that there is an abundance of more or less scanty references in the most varied texts, which gives us some very disjointed information about Egyptian notions concerning God, the creator, and the evolution of the world and life on it. It is important to keep these thoughts in mind as we consider the views of the ancient Egyptians regarding creation. After an extensive investigation of these Egyptian texts, my conclusion is this. While it is true that Egyptian te creation texts do, in fact, have a focus on how the universe operates and how mankind functions within it, this is not at the exclusion of concerns about the origins of the material creation. It is clear, at least to me, that material origins were of utmost importance to the ancient Egyptians in their literature. The beginning of physical objects in the universe is a distinct aspect of the various creation accounts. Self-creation of a creator God. A number of texts not only describe the creation of the universe, but even picture the creator God materializing in an act of self-creation. Utterance 587 of the pyramid text states, Praise to you, Adam. Praise to you, Kephra, who created himself. You became high in this your name, high ground. You created yourself in this your name, Kephra. That's from the Pyramid Age. Later Egyptian creation texts echo this belief that the creator God was a product of self-creation. Coffin text 17, 714 says, I am new, the one with no equal. I came into being 
on the great occasion of the inundation when I came into being. I am he who flew, became, I won't even try that, <clears throat> who is in his egg. Probably you need to supply vowels for that, and that's why. Um, I am he who began there new. See the chaos God come forth from me. See, I am prosperous. I created my body and my glory. I am he who made myself. I formed myself according to my will and according to my heart. So the Egyptians had a self-made God. This idea that the creator God brought himself into being is a common element of creation, Egyptian creation texts, including the sun hymn of Harmhab, spell 601 of Coffin text, spell 85 of the Book of the Dead. The ancient Egyptians were interested in where the creator God came from and when he began his existence. Creation of other gods. Numerous texts then describe the acts of the creator God in bringing into existence the lesser gods of the cosmos that are personified in the various physical elements of the universe. These acts are pictured in a variety of ways, some of which we'll see next. Uh, spell 245 of the coffin text alludes to that earlier text when the god Shu says to the creator god Adam, this was the manner of your engendering. You conceived with your mouth and you gave birth from your hand in the pleasure of emission. I'm afraid the explanation of that last phrase probably is not safe for work. Um, I am the star that came forth from the two. One further discussion of creation is the Memphite theology of the old kingdom found on the Shabaka stone. It tells of the god Ptah, who made all and brought the gods into being. Ptah is glorified in this text because he formed the universe by speech, that is, by mere verbal fiat. It sounds like another story you may have heard. He spoke and the gods burst forth. These stories are frankly and directly concerned with explaining the details of the history of the physical universe as it comes into being. Ancient Egyptian theogony is cosmogonic. It explains the origins of the universe. Because each of the gods fashioned by the creator God is a personification of an element of nature, as I've written elsewhere. Thus, in some of the myths, the creator God produced four children who correspond to the basic structure of the universe, Shu, or air, Tefnut, or atmosphere, Geb or earth, and newt or heavens. Interesting, it doesn't have water in that group of four. Um, <clears throat> they in turn breed another generation of gods who represent elements of nature. For example, Steth, which is storm. So we must in no way think that the Egyptian creation myths describe merely a metaphysical or spiritual creation. Creation of mankind, the same is true of the creation of mankind in Egyptian literature. Many texts refer to that event and the fact that humanity was specially formed by a creator god. Some texts portray the creator god as a potter who creates mankind by molding it on a potter's wheel or table. Um, for instance, the creator god Knum is pictured as modeling people on his wheel. He has fashioned men. Um, I didn't know that we were... Uh, symmetrical in that way, but whatever. The creator god Ptah is similarly represented as a potter crafting mankind out of a lump of clay, which is a little more easy to envision. Um, although that sounds vaguely like another story we've heard. Man is clay and straw, and God is his potter, is the pronouncement of in the instruction of Amenemope. Then, uh, thus, in contrast to Walton's contention in Genesis 1 through 3, like other ancient Near Eastern texts, is primarily interested in function rather than origins. In Egyptian texts, there is a substantial for focus on the origin of the universe. The purpose and function of mankind in creation are not central ideas. The Egyptian texts have much more to do with humanity's origins than with humanity's utility and capacity. Now, one can argue that there isn't a concise um, account of origins at this point. Uh, but of course that is part part of the point is that there isn't a concise uh, unified one but where there is one nothing is said about where the uh, uh, what the function of man is in that situation. 
which, by the way, is in contrast to the Mesopotamian one. So what, what Walton is really saying is Egyptian texts don't count. The Mesopotamian ones are the ones that count. Well, what about the Mesopotamian ones? A significant Mesopotamian creation text among the cosmological texts of Mesopotamia, perhaps the most important, is the Babylonian epic called Enuma Elish. It should be italicized. This document does, does spend a lot of time describing the order, function, and purpose of the various elements of creation. For instance, the purpose of mankind in the universe is stated directly. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. Other guys, I guess the gods work too hard. Um, however, such descriptions are not at all the exclusion of acts of, of descriptions of material creation. Thus, the passage just quoted begins with the following words by the creator god Marduk. Blood will I mass and cause bones to be. I will establish a savage man shall be his name. Verily, savage man, I will create. A rift between origins, the act of creation of mankind, and function, man's place in the order of creation, is not evident here. Both are present. The same holds true for the rest of the universe as described in the Enuma Elish. While Walton and others are certainly correct that a good part of the text deals with the creator God's ordering of the universe and assigning of functions to its various parts, this text certainly does not omit attention to material origins. For example, central to the story is a cosmic battle between the gods of order and the gods of chaos, and this supports Walton's claim that there is concern for function. Yet, the beginning of the text describes a situation in which material things did not exist and then tells how they were brought into being through divine agency. When the heavens above did not exist and the earth beneath had not come into being. In fact, uh, when the heavens above is a Numa Ilish. Uh, the title of the, of the, P, of the writing. Uh, there was Apsu, first, the first in order their begetter, and the demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. They mingled their waters together before Meadowland had coalesced and reed bed was to be found when none, not one of the gods had been formed or had come into being. When no destinies had been decreed, the gods were created in them. The watery chaos pictured in this text consists of two gods, Apsu and Tiamat, who create other deities through sexual procreation. Created gods each represented a vital element of the universe, such as sky, water, and earth. This second generation desires order rather than the chaotic status quo of Apsu and Tiamat. Order wins the day in a great cosmic battle. The point is, again, that the text is concerned about both the ordering of the universe and its material origins. Averbeck puts it well when he concludes, driving a wedge between material creation is over against giving order to the cosmos by assigning functions or roles is a false dichotomy that cannot bear the weight of the text. It is interesting that Walton comments, our first proposition is that Genesis 1 is ancient cosmology. In these ways, and many others, they thought about the cosmos in much the same way as anyone in the ancient world thought. I agree that Genesis 1 is similar to other ancient cosmology in several important ways. But since it is evident that ancient Near Eastern creation accounts had great concern for both function and material origins, we would expect the biblical creation account to have the same focus and interest. Consequently, the idea that the origins debate can be swept away because Genesis 1 through 3 is not paying attention to physical material beginnings is simply mistaken. Functions and origins in Genesis 1 through 3. The Hebrew creation account begins with the words, in the beginning God created. The verb used in Genesis 1-1 for create is only and always used for the work of God when it appears in the call stem, as it does here. In the call stem, it is not used for the action of mankind. Simply put, it is God who is at work in Genesis 1. This is his creation. Verse 1 then describes the object of God's creative activity. It was the heavens and the earth. Here we see a figure of speech called a merism, which is a set of opposites that are all inclusive. And there's some examples, uh, both in the Old and the New Testament. It is a designation for all that exists. God has simply created all things. In verse 2, the universe, and in particular the earth, is pictured in the process of creation. It is described as tohu, that is, without form. 
This is a Hebrew word that commonly reflects a state of wildness and wilderness. It, is in, it indicates a circumstance of chaos and what is unordered. The earth is also described as bohu, which is often translated void. Uh, it, it denotes emptiness. So at this point in the account, the earth is wild and empty. It is tohu and bohu. We certainly do not want to underappreciate this aspect of the creation account. God made things for certain specific roles, functions, and purposes. The problem with Walton's functional model is that it highlights the roles of the elements of the universe at the expense of their actual creation. The reality is that God was not only ordering the cosmos and assigning roles to the different parts of nature, but he was filling the universe as well. In other words, he created light, oceans, land, plants, celestial bodies, animals, and humans. To interpret Genesis 1 as merely about functions and not about origins is a failure to account for some of the very prominent features of the narrative. Genesis 1 through 3 as myth. Another way that supporters of theistic evolution attempt to resolve the conflict between the Bible and evolution is by claiming that Genesis 1 through 3 is not factual history but is an ancient Near Eastern myth. They're using the word myth in the sense of a legendary story without determinable basis in fact or in history. In regard to creation, they see myth as a symbolic tale of a primordial time that deals principally with the realm of the gods. It is a narrative only in the sense that the story, such stories have a linear forward movement, but they are simply a historical. Their purpose is to explain the order and meaning of the universe as it stands, which that last phrase almost sounds like one all over again. Theistic evolution advocates Peter Enns, advocate Peter Enns, argues for the Genesis 1 through 3 as myth position. We won't go into too much of that. The belief that the Hebrew creation account is based on the Babylonian creation myth and is itself mythic has been standard fare for a long time among liberal Old Testament scholars. For example, Gunkel. But this approach raises a question. Why does Genesis 1 and 3, 1 through 3, contain so many elements that appear to be literal history if, in fact, it was borrowed from an ancient Near Eastern myth? Many liberal scholars answer that the writer of Genesis borrowed ancient Near Eastern myths of creation and then stripped them of their mythological elements and made them look like historical records. Okay. The author thus employed a form of demythologization to rid the creation story of myth. Sounds suspiciously like what the, uh, uh, like the higher critics were doing to the Bible itself. And then replaced it with a monotheistic, non-mythic, orthodoxy but wait a minute if you if it's non-mythic then you can't really call it myth at that point uh, but then how can they be so sure it, it originated in a myth these same commentators believe through a close reading of Genesis 1 through 3 they can still see some of the original mythic character and this is important for our study for if Genesis 1 through 3 is merely a sanitized text that is really mythic at its core then the question of origins, including human beginnings, is a moot one. Myths are never intended to be taken as real history in the first place. So they just didn't finish up the demythologization, I guess. No doubt there are many parallels between the Hebrew creation account and the myths of the ancient Near East. The question is, is the position of demythologization the best explanation for the relationship between the two literatures? There are compelling reasons for rejecting the Genesis as myth view. The mythic explanation underestimates the deep, fervent resistance of the Hebrews to anything that even smacks of the mythological. Again, many modern commentators view any reticence to myth as a very late aspect of the compositional process of the early chapters of Genesis. To the contrary, I would argue that Genesis 1 through 3 is at its very core anti-mythological, and this can be seen in its polemical quality and disposition. Since I have dealt elsewhere with the polemical nature of the Hebrew creation account, I will not take time to restate my entire case in detail, but will give some specific examples of polemic at work in the general account of the creation and the human origins in particular. Anti-mythic polemic in the creation of humanity. In the Mesopotamian creation myth, the gods created mankind for the specific purpose of easing the workload of the deities. The Atrahasis text says... The God's load was too great, the work too hard, the trouble too much. A little further on, 
the gods dug out the Tigris River, then then dug out the Euphrates. That's a lot of work. For 3,600 years they bore the excess. Hard work, day, night and day, they groaned and blamed each other. Mankind's function was to be a slave to the gods so they might be at ease. After their creation, humans multiplied quickly and they became a thorn in the sides of the gods. People are tumultuous and they disturb the sleep of the gods, in particular Enlil, the head of the pantheon. And the country was noisy as a bellowing bull. The gods grew restless at their racket. And then a little later, he, I presumably, it's Enlil, addressed the great gods. The noise of mankind has become too much. I'm losing sleep over their racket. Give the order that the Sarupu disease shall break out. Kill him. And those attempt to destroy humanity with a plague is a failure. He then tries to inflict them with a famine, but that fails as well. Finally, he orders a flood to consume them all. It is clear that the deluge in the Atrahasis epic contains several similarities and has parallels with the biblical account of the flood. But there are far greater differences. Israel's account of mankind's creation in the subsequent flood is opposed at its very heart to the worldview conceptions of the rest of the ancient Near East. Humanity's creation is not for the purpose of being slaves to the gods and to carry their workload, but rather mankind is created in the image of God as the crown of creation and as God's co-regent ruling over the created order. The flood in scripture is not a consequence of mankind's not caring for the ease of the gods or awakening the gods from their slumber. These gods have all the foibles of human character. Rather, it is due to mankind's unholiness in contrast to a holy God, as described in Genesis 6, 5. Such major distinctions cannot be accounted for by a simple cleansing of myth from the text. Anti-mythic polemic in the creation of the luminaries. In ancient Near Eastern creation text, the dominant feature is theogony, which refers to the creation of the gods who are personified in the elements of the universe. The forming of astral bodies of the sun, moon, and stars is theogonic. So in the Mesopotamian Enuma Elish, the creator god Marduk made the gods and then constructed stations for the great gods, fixing their astral likenesses to as constellations. The biblical author, in contrast, presents God as creating the luminaries, but there is no interest in theogony. He is rigidly monotheistic and sanctions no deification of the heavenly bodies. Heidel comments, the opening chapters of Genesis, as well as the Old Testament in general, refer to only one creator and maintainer of all things, one God who created and transcends all cosmic matter. In the entire Old Testament, there is not a trace of theogony, such as we find with, for example, in, we find, for example, in, in, in Uma Elish and Hesiod, who wrote theogony, I think is what it's called in Greek. It is significant that the luminaries are not given names in the Genesis 1 account. They are merely called the two great lights, one being the greater light and the other being lesser light and the stars. While some commentators believe this fact has no significant or that, uh, significance or that it is simply the rhetorical high style of the narrative, <clears throat> it clearly distinguishes the Israelite worldview from the other ancient Near Eastern theogonic views. The luminaries, Hazel, and by the way, that is uh, Gerhard Hazel, and some of you may remember, correctly comments, they share in the creatureliness of all creation and have no autonomous divine quality. Other examples could easily be cited of Hebrew polemic in the Genesis creation account against common ancient Near Eastern creation documents. The conclusion is obvious. Ancient Near Eastern creation texts are myth, and they bear all the identifying marks of myth, so things such as polytheism, theogony, magic, and fertility. But Genesis 1 through 3 is zealously anti-mythological. It is monotheistic to its very core, and it in no way sanctions the existence of other gods or the creation of other gods. Now, that's the end of the, uh, uh, that part of the chapter. Um, my own opinion on this is John Curd makes a good case that the creation account is intended to be historical. In the first part of the chapter, he deals with two ways of avoiding this conclusion. One can claim that the account is simply intended to be a functional description and one can claim that the account was intended to be understood as myth and so not taken seriously historically. 
Now, I think Currid points out against Proposition 1 that the pagan myths were also concerned with origins, so one should expect that the Hebrew story was concerned with origins. That is, you can't get around the origins by saying that it's concerned with function. It might be further pointed out that often in other areas, function is tied to origin. The firstborn in Israelite society got the lion's share of the inheritance precisely because he was the firstborn. That is, the history determined the order. And if the history were different, the order would be different. The sons of Aaron were priests precisely because they were sons of Aaron. And this is not just Hebrew propaganda. It turns out that people whose uh, name is Kohen in Jewish uh, society have all the same or uh, descended from the same Y chromosome. It means that, yes, there really was somebody who could conceivably have been Aaron. It is not completely clear how myths function in, patient, in pagan society. However, I think we must not import our concept of myth uncritically into an ancient context. You see, it is entirely possible that the ancients were more serious about myths than we give them credit for that they actually believed them in a certain sense. We tend to import a Christian evaluation of pagan myths into the pagan view. That is to say, eh, they don't really count. They're not, they're not really believable. I rather suspect that the pagans viewed the myths differently. They actually believed them. They did not apply critical reasoning to the myths because their society was more of an authoritarian one. Uh, people who knew what they're talking said something and you believed them which is a good way of preserving what civilization you have. In some cases, experimental evidence, if you want to call it that, experiential evidence, certainly, which is kind of like science in a way, was allowed to modify the myths. That is, if Marduk City conquered everything, obviously Mar Marduk was the top god. The truth is that Walton, and there are others who follow in go along with him, uh, and he will figure at least, in at least two other ways of avoiding the conclusion that Genesis 1 and 2 were intended to be history. I don't think he's being sensitive to the text. He is in some ways, but not in others. So much as he is really trying to avoid the obvious conclusion. He wants to see himself as a Bible believer. He wants to accept what he perceives as science. And the direct conclusion is that the Bible cannot be intended to be history. And that's just the... Uh, so it must have some other functions, so he's looking for all the other functions he can. It is only for Walton to figure out how it did not intend to be history. And four different ways are fine with him, even if they are um, possibly slightly kind of not completely compatible. Because what you need is the conclusion. This view ignores the fact that the science started out trying to ignore, or perhaps worse, contradict the Bible. Now, one can easily see that in Darwin. Uh, but it actually began before Darwin. And for those of you who haven't seen the evidence, I'm going to give you a letter of Charles Lyell to Robert Murchison. Charles Lyell being, of course, uh, the founder of the, uh, or the, summator actually because it goes beyond Charles Darwin or before Charles Darwin and if you're interested you can go to the link there and it cites uh, Terry Martin sort of which cites uh, uh, Brooke and then uh, there's another letter which we'll come to after the after this one but the letter to Murchison is revealing I trust I shall make my sketch of the progress of geology popular Old uh, Fleming is frightened and thinks that the age will not stand my anti-mosaical conclusions. So he clearly felt that Moses was wrong. And at least that the subject will for a time become unpopular and awkward for the clergy. But I am not afraid. I shall out with the whole, but in as, in, in as conciliatory manner as possible. Manner as possible. 
And then another letter, which is even more interesting. It's the second one I mentioned. Um, I'm sure you may get into the quarterly review what will free the science from Moses, which implies that the science needed to be freed from Moses. For if treated seriously, the church party are quite prepared to, for it. The church of England seems to be happy with this. A bishop, Buckland ascertained, we suppose Bishop Sumner, gave Uri addressing in the British Critic and Theological Review. They see at last the mischief and scandal brought on them by mosaic systems. Probably there was a beginning. It is a metaphysical question worthy of a theologian. Probably there will be an end. Species, as you say, have begun and ended, but the analogy is faint and distant. Perhaps it is an analogy, but all I say is there are, as Hutton said, no signs of a beginning, no prospect of an end. So Lyle was clearly in the Hutton camp. All I ask is that at any given period of the past, don't stop inquiry when puzzled by refuge to a beginning, which is all one with another state of nature, as it appears to me. But there is no harm in your attacking me, provided you point out it is the proof I deny, not the probability of a beginning. I was afraid to point the moral as much as you can do in the QR about Moses. Perhaps I should have been tenderer about the Quran. Don't meddle with much with that, if at all. Well, certainly, if he were alive today, he would be much more tender with the Quran. But <laughs> if we don't irritate, which I fear that we may, through mere history, we shall carry all with us. If you don't triumph over them, but compliment the liberality and candor of the present age, the bishops and the enlightened saints will join us in despising both the ancient and modern physical theologians. It is just the time to strike, so rejoice that sinner as you are, the QR is open to you. Whoa. P.S. I conceived the idea five or six years ago that if ever the mosaic genealogy could be set down without giving offense, it would be in a historical s sketch and you must abstract mine in order to have as little say as possible yourself. Let them feel it and point the moral. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. What? Well, if you're if you're not ready and somebody else, is, well, I, uh, we, have, we have two people here, so you don't have to. Okay, <laughs> let, let us have a chance first. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, if we're going to set about to determine which parts of Genesis are, are myth and literal, what? How would we approach that task? Uh, interesting question, isn't it? And again, I, I rather suspect that the... Um, see, for an ancient person who said that Marduk uh, uh, slayed Tiamat and cut her body in half and made the earth and heavens out of it and did all this stuff, uh, you would say, well, how does, how does the myth maker know? Well, because Marduk's city is taking over the world. So obviously Marduk must be the top god, and obviously then he had to be the god that set things up in the beginning. That's part of the job of the top god. So there's actually a logic behind it. What about the myth of the flood? Well, that's an interesting question. The myth of the flood, interesting, seems to have gone into a large number of civilizations more than any other specific myth and that raises the question maybe it wasn't a myth maybe they all actually remembered and in fact if you want to know how far back it goes in Chinese a big boat is a, a boat with eight people on it you can it's still there in their characters today Pardon me. I find I always find it interesting that 
if you want to win, you allege that something you're criticizing is a myth without realizing that many, many myths have a real foundation. So if you can use the Appalachian myth, you've won the battle. Mm -hmm. Second, very I interesting that here and in other places, the actual day-to-day -day story of creation is ignored completely, i.e. evening and morning, etc., phrased in such a way intended to be upfront interpreted as real time. This, this didn't come up because I listened. Now, I've heard it in previous discussions, though it's not an area I'm really proficient in. I'm still wondering about those two things. The wording, which Hazel, as you point out, make, made a very big deal of, as, and also Dick Davidson do, do that from the seminary, but uh, I'm not sure why the critiques you were talking about avoid the one and use the term myth without acknowledging it's the possibility that it came from real events. Uh, well, I, the, the chapter is deliberately not gaining into the day-age controversy because if you do, then you're taking sides with uh, young age creationism versus uh, old age creationism. And one of the things they're trying to do is to allow everyone who believes that God intervened and you can tell to read this book and say amen. Um, but I think your point is there that um, while it may be, uh, shall we say, ecumenical, it is not necessarily a good biblical exegesis. That the same story that, that gives you that God created very specifically did kind of do everything he reasonably could to make sure that it was evening and morning days. And then again in Exodus 20 and in Exodus, I think it's 31, uh, there's another, uh, another recounting of the Ten Commandments. And in both cases it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Presumably meaning that the weekly cycle came from the very first week. And, you know, it fits the, it fits the Hebrew mind which is, you were born first, therefore you get the extra goodies. Aaron was uh, the brother of, the, of, of Moses, and he was on Moses' side for a long time, and therefore his children get the priesthood. Um, the, the reason for the story was precisely because the history was supposed to have some impact on future history, which is how things are now. That's the reason for recounting those things. And if you think about it, uh, we still have that impulse today. Uh, you go to somebody, uh, you go to uh, uh, some place, uh, let's say Sequoia National Park or Yosemite National Park, and they'll say, and this building was started by so-and-so, and then it burned down in a fire at such-and-such, and then you realize, and that's why all the decor and everything is 1920s, is because that's when it was rebuilt, you know? And uh, uh, in, you know, all of that kind of stuff comes out that way. You know, the Indians used to call it this, or Native Americans, I guess they say now, uh, and uh, and uh, and that's how it got its name. You know, uh, and the fact of the matter is that 
etymological stories are constantly used. You know, in our in our country, the Constitution is that way. You know, uh, some people got together and they said this, and this is how they wrote it down, and that's why our country is the way it is. And the Constitution was put together in a very nice way. Um, you know, some people feel it's God-given, but that's debatable. Uh, but it certainly is. Uh, it was certainly was a very strong attempt to try to coordinate stuff. Uh, and people thought about, well, what happens if the uh, uh, and in this, for example, the story of George Washington having had two terms and then saying that's enough and walking off instead of being president for life had a huge impact upon uh, the way our successor, his successors uh, operated. Two terms and they were out too. Uh, until Franklin D. Roosevelt made it four terms and was president for life. And then the country said no more of that and put in a, uh, uh, a constitutional amendment, which actually didn't force Truman out, but did, uh, but did require that everybody else uh, uh, couldn't be president for life. Two terms was enough. So they actually codified what was a historical precedent. And whenever you have historical precedent being used, you have an etymology and it is based on history. And, and so that, that instinct is there both in Judean history and, you know, I suppose you could say that we're influenced by Judean history, and we probably are, but by our culture today, which has other influences besides Judean history, I rather suspect that if you go to China, you're going to be told about, uh, well, you would have until the communists came to power, and I think even then they would probably acknowledge the history behind it, that you know certain things were put that way by the ancient Chinese, and that's the way it went from then on. Um, and those are etymological stories, but they're intended to be grounded on history. And for somebody to say, well, they're just explaining how things are, or they're just explaining the functions of things, which is really kind of a, another way of saying how things are, um, or they're just explaining an old myth, are just, are just ways of saying, yeah, they said that, but, th but in the case of an old myth, they didn't believe that. In the case of an old function, they didn't believe that. And to say that they didn't believe that really requires more justification than being able to just... I would rather just simply say they believed that, but they were wrong, than I would say uh, that they didn't really believe that, because the story reads like they really meant it. And the reason for saying they didn't believe that is because they is can't have believed that. Is because, be, is because that. you do not believe what they might have believed. Exactly, and if and if and if you admit that you don't believe what they believed, then at that point you can't say that it's that the Bible is inerrant or even really in important aspects authoritative. And now you put yourself outside of the community uh, in an important way. And so this is a struggle to stay in the community but still accept what science proves. Uh, this uh, talk this morning, of course, uh, underlines an issue that uh, is probably extremely important to Adventism, of course, and 
But it's true for I Presbyterianism, too. I mean, it's true for any conservative Christianity. I, I sit there and uh, uh, marvel to a certain extent that this book uh, uh, so far escaped the real issue as to uh, about Genesis, uh, giving us all kinds of information. Uh, and, you know, so many churches have done this. They, uh, all major, I might say, denominations have, you know, allegorized or whatever you want to do, mythologized Genesis and so on, uh, that uh, you wonder, uh, but this, this book really, really avoids that issue uh, uh, very loudly in a ways uh, without saying anything about it uh, so far. Well, I... I there's so much support here for the Bible in this thing. And yet, uh, that one issue, we don't talk about it. Of course, that, that's the outline of the book. It's the purpose of the book, and so I understand that very well. Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to make a statement that you need to keep in mind. Uh, people have a hard time thinking one... It occurred in six days, two, it was only maybe six to 10,000 years ago. Uh, three, there was a worldwide flood and all these animals were preserved and, uh, uh, and so on. So uh, there's some difficulty there. And we could say, well, uh, so uh, uh, which is more reasonable? Well, you have you have not come up with a, a non-mythical, if I can use that term, uh, non-polemically. You have not come up with a non-mythical, mythical, uh, plausible, workable answer to to the Bible. You, so, so, to a certain extent, we have to deal with the fact that uh, we're dealing with a um, with. Certain issues that, uh, hey, uh, something is different here. Something is different. Uh, and we're going to have to give in on, uh, uh, at least those of us who love science, we're going to have to give in uh, somewhere sooner or later here on, on uh, trying to explain everything by matter and motion, that, that, that trend, that... Um, uh, and so on, and uh, admit, hey, there, there's something beyond that. And, and to a certain extent, the, the issue is, uh, so which story are we going to believe? And uh, I do find the Bible more reasonable, not because of the overwhelming scientific publications that support it because that's not the case at all but because that science has done so poorly in, in, in the, some very critical areas and uh, I think it is not unreasonable to believe the biblical account because mm -hmm. you do have that scientific data that really is hard to answer unless you believe it I'm speaking of evidences for the flood, which I keep talking about, and uh, radiometric dating uh, dates that if you trust radiometric dates and don't think they changed, uh, carbon-14 really challenges this. Uh, and so, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, issues of, you know, why, why do we exist? Uh, why do we think there's good and bad and all this stuff, those, those uh, other mental factors and so on? You throw that all in. Uh, and the fact that humanity has, doesn't look like humanity's been here that long, you know, and that's, that's to be a fairly strong issue. That, you know, our history is so recent, our archaeology is so recent, and so on, that it doesn't look that man has been here all that long. Uh, 
So I, I find that issue that more reasonable. I try to be understanding because, uh, and people have a very hard time with this six-day creation, the recent six-day creation. But man, you got to come up with something more reasonable if you want me to adopt another model. And I, I don't see it there. I see, I see questions at times and so on, but I don't see anything better. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's one thing, and that is that the six-day creation isn't the real problem. The real problem is the time element in terms of a thousand years ago versus billions. Um, and if you get the the latter question straightened out, uh, then the former question disappears one way or another, really. Uh, if you assume that it's been mm-hmm. billions of years, then, uh, then the whole story doesn't make a lot of sense. If you uh, and and the attempt to put day age is mm-hmm. is another one of those stop gaps. I would I would uh, add though that uh, six day creation an old six day creation story. Once you are acquainted with the fossil record order in the fossil record, it just falls apart immediately. Mm-hmm. You're not going to. Have a complete creation six days ago, way back down there. When you look at that fossil record, the only answer is the flood, as I can see it, and and yep. uh, it's, that is not free of, of questions uh, entirely. I mean, uh, the the uh, order is really extreme in certain cases, but I, I'm not sure it's as extreme as it's in the literature because the literature is so biased by. Uh, mm-hmm. Long ages model that uh, it's bound to uh, reflect that. Yeah. Uh, seems to me that one of the, one of the primary objections to a six day creation stems from the fact that of our wholesale uh, acceptance of uh, of uh, uniformitarianism, i.e., that that nature. Ha- that the nature, the way nature behaves now, and the speed in which nature behaves now, has always been the case, and and it's never been otherwise, which is bizarre, considering that there, as far as I know, there's there's no natural cosmogony that can explain the existence of nature. So, therefore, it seems to me logically necessary that some other f- mode of nature, i.e., supernatural, is necessary in, in order to explain the existence of nature in the first place. And if that's the case, then there's no objection whatsoever to a six-day creation because supernatural is not bound by natural processes. I think there's, that it's more than just the sweep of nature, although that's an important mm-hmm. point. There's also the fact that there, is, uh, there are parts of nature that really don't lend themselves well to a... Um, uh, an explanation uh, without without things being much shorter than commonly believed. Um, you have conglomerate laid out in vast, relatively thin sheets. I mean, thick in terms of absolute, like maybe um, 90 meters or something like that. But in terms of in terms of the the extent of, you know, uh, you're talking a hundred feet over a hundred thousand square miles. Yeah, and and more in some cases, and in a, in a nice neat little layer. There's nothing like that going on right now. There is no prospect absent a major catastrophe, and this is this is one of the points that Derek Ager made. Even though he doesn't like the idea of this being, you know, part of a major recent catastrophe, he recognizes that it has to be a catastrophe. And I think if most geolo- uh, geologists were pushed, they would find themselves kind of not without any defenses against agreeing with him. Well, um the, the flood is uh, took place well after the the uh, 
the first six days. Right. And, and so what I'm trying to refer, uh, refer to here is how is it that anything exists at all? <coughs> Uh, and I'm, and I th- as far as I know, there is no rational, mm-hmm. naturalistic explanation for why the, the cosmos exists in the first place. Yeah. And so, therefore, it becomes logically necessary to think outside that box. And once we do that, we're no longer bound by, it, by its limitations. Yeah. Uh, w- once you accept that, that there was a creator, <coughs> then how the creation exists today... The, the myth, to use it in its positive sense, uh, of of the story of how it happened to hap- happen to happen, is much uh, owes as much to the desires of that creator as it does to what nature can do on its own. And so, the whole attempt to explain it by nature doing it without interference. Mm-hmm. is really kind of um, it's an attempt to fit every hole with a round peg and there are some holes that are just simply square and some of them that are star shaped and you're not going to get that without doing a bunch of carving on either the hole or the peg it just doesn't fit yeah, I, I, th- I just think we're just way too willing to give in to the naturalistic philosophy. Uh, I, want, I want to second uh, that uh, for comment here, and that is uh, if there's any existence by itself, why isn't matter just an amorphous goo? And by that I mean <laughs> no laws, the laws of all the precise forces of physics that are absolutely have to be exact in order for matter to exist. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, uh, if matter was amorphous goo, then we wouldn't be here. Yes. The fact that we're here argues that m- there's more than amorphous goo. And, and the uh, fact that science is as successful as it is argues that there's more than amorphous goo. And that means that eventually you have a uh, you have a creator to begin with, and then the only question is, has he interfered in the meantime? And at mm-hmm. the origin of life, you're kind of forced to the conclusion that, yes, he has. And then mm. further on, the origin of various other animals, and then the only real questions are, did mankind have a special origin, and how long did it take? This book will go up to mankind had a special origin. It stops there. Now, the, the uh, I think the you know in, in the um, Newton's time and uh, uh, when modern science was developing itself and so on, uh, there's no question uh, about the flood and the recentness of creation. I mean, there were a few skeptics around, but everybody, you know, oh, sure, that's that's the way it's been. Uh, this long ages is a, is a modern addition to uh, science, uh, and uh, I think, of course, uh, forced on to a certain extent by by wanting to explain everything naturalistically. You know, mm-hmm. More time you have, more chance you have for improbabilities. Uh, but right now we, we're facing a. Uh, a society and a, uh, an ethos, I might say, uh, that, hey, uh, the present is the key to the past, and we don't see anything happening now, and uh, none of us have seen a worldwide flood. Uh, so, uh, and except for as you mentioned, the, the, all these ancient uh, myths, and the, 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 the figures are striking, the number of myths for the flood, compared to myths of other causes, is overwhelming. In, in the uh, folk literature, it's overwhelming. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we well, nothing's happening today, and tomorrow uh, we don't expect anything to happen. Nothing happened yesterday, so... 
uh, we tend to get into a uniformitarian mode of thinking without realizing that you go back far enough, you can't answer without invoking something beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. In other words, something beyond of the uniformitarianism. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And that's not a flattering comparison. <laughs> anyway, so so next week we'll see three other dodges as to how the Bible doesn't really mean what it seems like it uh, says it means. And, uh, I just, you know, I think that these people who wrote the book are just, it's phenomenal what they did. And it's not surprising anymore that uh, that the book has as many sales as it does because it scratches where people are itching. It sets up the issue like you can't imagine. Go ahead. I'm sitting here the past several weeks, and I would just like to say I'm so thankful to God that he did not have scientists write the Bible. <laughs> On the other hand, it might, it might have actually... Wait a minute. Ben, it might have actually been the scientist of the day that wrote the Bible. Uh, Moses was not I take, stupid. I take that back. <laughs> Moses was not stupid. No. I mean, smart people wrote it. And they wrote it by inspiration of God. But you're talking about modern scientists who don't want to believe in God. That's probably what I'm thinking, yeah. modern scientists. Uh, you know, Satan throws smoke. He throws shade. He throws darkness. And that's what the whole world is about from now until Christ comes. Yeah, yeah.